Amen. I don't know, some of you, most of you probably was not aware of or didn't, didn't know about, but there was a number of years ago, uh, Texas was going through one of the greatest droughts that they had ever seen. I mean, it, pictures I saw, <laughs> saw in uh, Texas were some of the most horrible things of drought uh, conditions that was going on. And there was a pastor down there, James Poole, who was so burdened with this uh, need is that he said, we, we got to have a prayer meeting and, and cry out to God. And uh, so they gathered all their people together for this prayer meeting. Now, again, you may have hold, heard the old uh, joke that a lot, some preacher said is that they, in the old days, farmers were praying for prayer or for rain during the harvests when it was starting to get dry. And so they had this great call, hey, we're going to have a prayer meeting for rain. And so all these people came, and there was just one little 12-year-old boy that came in with an umbrella. Nobody else <laughs> He said, I thought I was praying for rain. So he came prepared, but no one else was really, they were praying, but they weren't really believing. But James Poole came together, and they had this solemn assembly where they dealt with the need of sin in the church. And they, they had planned to stay, no matter how long it took. And I think they went on eight hours that day. And at eight hours, at the close of that, no forecast for rain, no signs of rain, no clouds, at the, at the end of that eight hours, there was a, one person. This shows you the importance of dealing with sin. There was one person that after eight hours finally broke. And they, they stood up and they said, I, I'm the reason that the rain hasn't come. They were under such conviction. And they confessed this sin that was in their life. And they, they asked for forgiveness from the church. For, and they, they, went, they said, I'm going to the person and I'm confessing to them that I've, I've done this against them and I want their forgiveness. And right then and there, the, the clouds rolled in and there was a crack of thunder and lightning. And the rain came down, uh, what we would call a gully washer, and just saturated the ground in, in rain. And again, all the people, when they saw that and heard that, said, oh, that's none. Yay. Now, they celebrated. They clapped. They erupted. They was like... The Lord heard us, the Lord answered. And I heard that testimony. So it was in that same time period of drought. If you remember good old New Creek down here, uh, you could walk across the stones. Uh, it was getting so dry. And I was praying with the pastors in the community at that time, and I said to them, I said, I said, what are we going to do? Wait till all of our water's gone uh, before we finally decide to pray? I said, let's, let's pray now. And they, hey, that's a great idea. Now, again, it's, it's something different. It's something novel. So that, that, I, I don't know, we had nine, ten churches participate. They had it down there at First Baptist Kaiser. Uh, and they come in, and, and my, my section that I dealt with was the sin that causes drought in that. And I, I went through the ABCs of that that I've shared with you before. Uh, let's, let's look at A, abominations, adultery, uh, agnosticism, atheism, B, uh, these uh, minds blank on that, but going, I went down to the ABCs of all that, and I took time with that, and just asked for them to bow their heads and to confess silently the sins in their hearts and lives and of our community. And I'll never forget that because the next day it rained, mm -hmm. and everybody that that participated in that said God heard us and God answered. Now those were two incidents of understanding where we're at who God is, and what we need to do. Most people I do not understand that in the church. Now again, I, how can the world, can you expect a lost person out from the world that's not sat in the church, never read the Bible, never heard the Bible? Uh, how can you expect for them to understand that? You can't. But God's people, I expect it. Now again, when people say, well, we've never studied the Bible as much as you, or read it as much as you, very few have. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an oddball. Uh, as, and don't amen that one either. I, I call getting ready to say amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, but, the, uh, but those are things that, again, uh, that it is necessary that we understand. What's going on? The signs of the times. The discerners of why things are happening. You know, I don't just say, oh, well, that's a chance. That's luck. That's 
coincidence. No, there's no such thing as that. Everything is by design. And you appreciate it in God's nature for what that is. But you understand who God is, how much impact he can have on the lives that we're leading right now. All this flood of evil, Isaiah 59, when a flood of evil comes in, God says, I'll raise up a standard against it to push it back. And that standard is his church. But if the standard does not push it back against the flood of evil, then the flood of evil fills the land. Now, that's just simple understanding of if you've ever watched the floodwaters come. So our problem is, a lot of this, is that we don't know who God is. So in Exodus chapter 5, it, it want to begin here today, starting to lay some of our th things that I've already shared with you, taught you on Monday night. And I spent a long, long period of time with you on the 17 pages in my prayer notebook. Who is God? That pure, unadulterated worship of God is just telling God what he's already said about himself. Lord, you said, you are the great I am. Lord, you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Those are just the names of God, the attributes of God. But there is still this ignorance that sits on many because, one, they're not studiers of it. They don't study God. And so here in this scenario, again, Exodus chapter 5, the first four chapters of Exodus, you, you should know, was that Israel was down in Egypt. They had been there for 400 years. And they had been put into slavery, even though Joseph had delivered them from the great seven years of famine. Uh, they had exiled Israel. Uh, they went down with 70 when they was during the days of Joseph. And now there are over 600,000 men, not counting women and children. So in 400 years, they went from 70 to 600,000 and a nation was born. Now, God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob two parts of the covenant. The first one was, I'll make you as the stars of the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Then that's what he's done. He's made them a multitude that's almost innumerable. The second thing is, he said, I'll promise to Abraham. He set him up on a mountain and he said, look to the north, south, east, and west. And all that you see of that land, I'll give to you. Now, wouldn't you like that? Huh? I'm going to take you up on Dolly Sods. Now look to the north, south, east. And I use that because that's the highest point around, isn't it? First knob. And, and say, my, our West Virginia class here, you, uh, <laughs> Tommy would be so proud. Yes. <laughs> so uh, to look to the north, south, east, and west and to say, all that I will give to you. Ah. Uh, what a, what a vast land, a beautiful land. That's the promised land. All of our songs that we talk and sing about when we cross over Jordan, we're going into the promised land, a land of milk and honey. A land, again, as you know, that when the, the, the spies went up, and Moses sent the spies up there, and it was harvest time, and, and that they cut down a, a, a cluster of grapes. How big was the grapes that they carried? Anybody? They put it on holes, yeah. put it on a pole on each end, and two of them had to carry it. How much grape jelly could you get out of that? That's, that's pretty good. Huh? I don't need a weapon in my hand, do I? You guys be in trouble. Uh, but that staff, and they had to carry it, that bundle of grapes, because it was so bountiful, so, so precious. You can't find that today. And the reason that you can't find that today is because the land is cursed. What, what causes the land to be cursed? Sin, rebellion, mm -hmm. disobedience. So you see the contrast. God is willing to fulfill his word. But it is the response of the people that accomplishes that. If they don't accomplish their part, then God will not accomplish his part. It's always a reciprocal response in this that we have to understand. So they're in slavery. God raises up Moses and Aaron. Chapter 4 is that great scene. Again, God's desire, his mercy, his grace. Does God want people to continue in rebellion? Does God want people to be in sin? Does God want people to be evil? Is that God's desire? 
This means no, this means yes. No, that's not his desire. His desire is for a holy people, a right people, so that he can manifest his works, that he can do great things, and that everybody will say, look what the Lord's done. The two great prayer meetings for rank. Who got the glory out of that? God. And when God is glorified, God is pleased. This is a worship service. We prayed here 20 minutes before, before we began for that. Be glorified in this place. Let us walk out of here saying, look what the Lord did. He heard me. He answered me. He's doing great things. Let God be glorified. And that's the question that we have to ask in our own lives. Lord, are you being glorified in my life? At work? In my decisions? In my choices? In my conversation, Lord, are you being glorified? Every Christian, as an individual, has to answer that. And if the answer is, mm, I don't think so, you're in a wrong relationship with God, with Christ. The church has to look at that. Is God being glorified in what we're doing? And that's the reason is that, again, to me, it's just about being keeping it simple. Don't get complicated. We're going to preach teach, we're going to pray, we're going to support these missions, and we're going to tell other people about Christ. That's our four objectives. Those four are no more. How's that sound? Keep it simple. So that God can be glorified in what we're doing. That's the agenda of this. But you see, there's someone in authority here over Israel that is not giving God the glory. Pharaoh. And we know by Pharaoh, Pharaoh is an evil man. Pharaoh is a hard man. And there are a lot of people out there like that today. They're, they may not be hard-hearted, but they are hard-headed. You can flip a coin on which one you want to say that they are. Uh, heads, they're hard-headed. Tails, they're hard-hearted. But most of that, they go side and side. They're not going to listen. They're not going to be told. And, and, and they're not going to tell God. Or God's not going to tell them. They're going to tell God. There are a lot of people like that. God deals with people like that in a harsh way. So... God comes to Moses in the burning bush, unique way, and says, you're going to go down to Pharaoh, and you're going to bring my people up out of Egypt, and you're going to fulfill what I want to do in this. So Moses goes down, him and Aaron, in chapter 5, and they have this conversation, and verse 2 is our central verse that I want to bring to you today, but we'll read uh, down through verse 9 about this, this dialogue when Moses and Aaron show up to Pharaoh. Verse 1, chapter 5. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in, and they, and they told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, and neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go. We pray you, three days journey into the desert, Sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Pestilence is disease. disease. <coughs> and the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you unto your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you make them to rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day, the taskmasters of the people and the officers, saying, You shall no more give the people straw to make brick, as heretofore. Let them go gather straw for themselves. And the tail of the bricks, which they did make heretofore, you shall lay upon them. You shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, Let us go sacrifice to our God. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. Let us pray. Blessed Father, we ask of you now that we may know you in the fullness and the power of your might, Lord. Or expand our minds, our understanding. Give us opportunities of heart to receive who you are, what you've revealed about yourself, what you want to do, what you want to do through us. And that again, Father, that we may be all that you want us to be for your glory and for your honor. Accomplish today, Father, your priority and purposes in us and through us, Lord, for the glory of your great name. In Jesus' name, 
I pray and I ask these things. Amen. Verse 2. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and neither will I let Israel go. Those two phrases there are a common issue that we have to deal with today. If you ask people this, who is God? Uh, how many of you know who Rav Zacharias is? Just a couple. Rav Zacharias is a um, answerer for the church. He goes on college campuses. He goes. He goes to worldwide Muslim groups, Buddhist, Hindu colleges, universities, nations, and he answers this question: Who is God? He's an apologetic. Uh, apologetic is someone that explains the beliefs and doctrines that we have of who and why and what and where and all of that. And he is a master at it. If you ever watch him uh, on any of his broadcasts, the YouTube clips, whatever, phenomenal wise man. Because again, he's got the face. Muslims that stand up and say, we say Allah is God. You say the Lord God, Jehovah is God. The Jews say uh, Jehovah is God. Why are you right and we're wrong? And he has to answer that. You know, most Christians, when they're faced with, well, who's God? Why should I listen to him? I don't know the Lord. Why am I supposed to get most Christians today? Because they're not studied. They're not prepared. You know, the Bible tells us uh, over in Colossians is that you need, to have an, you need to have an answer to all those that would ask questions of you. Let your speech be with grace, season with salt, that you may know how to answer every man that asks of you of the faith that is within you. Why are you a Christian? You say you're a Christian. Why are you a Christian? No, no. That's not a very good answer. That's not a very convincing answer to people is to say, well, if you don't know, then why do you want me to be one? Eternity is set in front of the, in the minds and the hearts of the Christians today to say, I, I've got to be a Christian. I've got to love God. I've got to serve God. I've got to be like Christ because I want to hear those words from him at the end. Well done. I'll live for him who did what? Who died for me. How, how glad I shall be when I appear before him in that because, again, I live for him. I'm living for you, Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm with, that's because I know who you are. I know what you're capable of doing. I know what you want to do. And everything is found in the hands of God. And that's one of the convincing things when I go to prayer time. I am having a conversation with the God of the universe, the God of the past, present, and future, the God of today, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or think in my prayer time. But it's because I know who he is and what he's wanting to do. He wants to be glorified. He wants to do miracles. He wants to save souls. He wants to do mighty powerful things in our nation today that brings us back to him in all this. But every time you try to do that, you run into a pharaoh. A pharaoh who stands up and says, well, I don't know who this God is. Why should I listen to him? I'm not going to give ear to him. You come across people like that, loved ones. You say, man, you really ought to start coming to church. Man, you really start all reading your Bible. Man, you really ought to get right with God. I said, well, why? I'm not such a bad person. You know, I'm trying to do good. You know, hey, I opened the door for a meeting the other day. I feel pretty good about that. Pat myself on the back. Hey, you know, hey, so-and-so had a flat tire. I jumped out there and helped him the other day. I did a good deed. I'm a good person. And the Bible says, and over in Romans chapter 3, there is none righteous. There is none good. No, not one. So when people excuse themselves to say, I'm good, I'm okay, are they good in the eyes of God? Are they right in the eyes of God? And you say, but we're Christians. Aren't we right in the sight of God? And the answer is no. The only thing that makes a Christian good in the sight of God is that God does not see us in our sinful nature, but that we have like a coat jacket on. And I always use that as an example of that. This is not my righteousness. That I read my Bible, I say my prayers, I go to church, I play the piano, I give my... No, that's no, those are good things in the sight of God. But the robe of righteousness of Christ. 
Christ robes me in his righteousness, and his righteousness is acceptable. Christ is. If I'm being righteous and doing good deeds and good works and all those things to be good, that's called self-righteousness. God despises self-righteousness. We don't do these things of reading our Bible, coming to church, praying, telling others. We don't do those things to exalt us. We do those things to exalt him. Priority is key. Why'd you get out of bed this morning? You know, Hannah said, I, I kicked Jeremiah out of bed. Well, that's one way to get out. Well, I got out of bed, and, and some people say, well, I got out on the wrong side. Yeah, we can tell. He got out of bed, well, gravity was stronger on that side, and once I started going, I couldn't stop, so I just went ahead and rolled all the rest of the way out. Well, I got up because I had to get up. None of those things glorify God. Christian, the church, gets up because they know who God is and they say, God, you're going to work today. You're going to do something today. And I want to be a part of it. God, I get up so that I can live for you. I get up so I can serve you. See, again, when we know what God's path is, his agenda is, it ain't about us. Well, what do I got to get done today? No, you turn the question around. Lord, what do you want to get done in me today? The church is asking this all the time. Lord, what are we supposed to be doing? What do you want us to do? How do you want us to respond? We're waiting. God's saying, I'm waiting on the church to respond to me because I want to do something. But I can't do it till you seek my face, till you call upon me, till you get before me. In times of drought, he wants to send the rain. In times of flood, he wants to recede the water. In times of, of evil, he wants to show his mighty hand of goodness. He's waiting for his church. And the more that we understand this, not be like Pharaoh, that we don't know who God is, but know who God is. That's the reason I said you have, you have to apply yourself to read. Study to show yourself approved unto God. I said so often, and I've done this in almost everything. Take a blank piece of paper, eight and a half by eleven piece of paper, blank on both sides. And sit down and write small letters, 12 font, 14 font, I'll even allow you. And write everything that you know about God, who he is, what he's done, what he's wanting to do. Every Christian should fill front and back of that. God is love. God is just. God is righteous. God is holy. God is jealous. God is pure. God is right. God is good. Right on down the line you go, your names, Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, uh, Shalom, you are the great banner, you are the great I am, you are the sympathizing one, the rose of Sharon, the lily of... Go on down through that, and the more that you know about him, the more it will be revealed in you as his child is to say, Lord, do that in me. But when we're like Pharaoh, who's God? Why should I listen to him? You will rise up in your own self and to say, well, this is what I want to do. This is what I, I'm going to live for. And most of the church in North America has followed that path. They're living for fame. They're living for riches. They're living for glory for themselves. You know, I, I, the book, one of the four books that, that I say is absolutely necessary for you to read and Christmas is right around the corner. So guess what you can get for your, your stocking stuffer? In His Steps. That is one little book. It's a testimony, a biographical book of this little village uh, up in New England, I think it was, back in the 1800s. Most of you have heard of WWJD, What Would Jesus Do? Have you seen the bracelets and the bumpers? Well, that WWJD come out of this book this historic book of, of In His Steps by Charles Sheldon. And Charles Sheldon wrote, writes this and says that there was this pastor of the church and he said to his congregation, he said, all of you that really want to get serious about God, stay afterwards and let's meet over in the library. So everybody that was like, yeah, whatever, we're serious, they all left. And there was like a couple dozens, I can't remember now exact number, but there was dozens of them that come over to the library, and he says, I want to ask of you to do one thing for the next 365 days, one year. I want you to ask the question and answer it in seriousness. What would Jesus do? 
before you make any choices, before you make any decisions, before answer that question for one year, and let's see what God does. And the rest of the book is a testament of what people's lives, how they were impacted. One guy next next door to the, the Mineral News Tribune, right? And and not for them, but for Cumberland, Cumberland paper, their big profit is the Sunday paper. I mean, you remember, you get, get a newspaper during the week, it's like that. You get the Sunday paper, it's like that. The Sunday paper is the big draw, always has been, uh, of economy. But this guy asked that with God, with Jesus, print a paper on Sunday. And he was convicted by it. He said, I can't, I can't do that. So he cut it. You know, they pitched a fit. The people pitched a fit because they didn't have the paper. The, the partners, the business financiers, said, you're going you're gonna to bankrupt us. And he said, I can't do this. So he stopped making the Sunday paper. And the trials, the testing that he went through to stay true to that. There was a railroad engineer. And the, and the bosses that he worked for, they were cutting corners costs on the railroad costs, on the brakes. And, and he said, as the laborers were cheating, he said, what would Jesus do? In good conscience, he couldn't let that go on. So he had to report, face the backlash against his bosses, against those that, that he had to report on, and, and face the scrutiny of losing his job, all that. And people said, well, but what would Jesus do? And the one that matters the most to me is that this woman, she had an opera soprano voice, just must have been fantastic. And her mother, who wanted the pride of that to uh, be a socialite, to have the name, oh, you're the mother of so-and-so, and that uh, prestige that goes in all the, all the parties and all the uh, gossip columns and all that in high society, she wanted her daughter to be famous, to be rich, to be, be on the opera in New York. But her daughter was in that group. And she asked the question, what would Jesus do with my voice? Would he sing in the Metropolitan Choir, an opera? Would he, would he do that? And she decided that with my voice, I need to sing for Jesus where Jesus wants me to sing. So she went down across the tracks down to Skid Row, where there was an old evangelist with a tent, preaching to the prostitutes, preaching to the bums, preaching to the alcoholics, the drunks. And she would use her voice down there. Her mother disowned her. Her mother pitched a fit. How dare you? You was going to have a name. You was going to have a life well to do. But she said, I have to be faithful to the call that Jesus put on me. She gave it all up for that. So I see these people today on America's Got Talent, on uh, what was the old one? The, 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 the song? The American Idol. American Idol. Oh, well, I'm a youth minister, I'm a music major, and I sing for the Lord, but I want to have a million dollar contract so I can be famous. They say it's for God, but it's not. It's for themselves. God doesn't get the glory out of that. They do. Ruin of our nation, of the God of self. When you know who God is, self has to die. I'll live for him who died for me. I have to die to self. We have forgotten that. That that is one of the requirements in the church today. Die to self, take up your cross, and come follow me. You stop worrying about what you want to do. And you start worrying about what he wants to do. Here's my life, Lord. I give it to you. Take me. Use me. Mold me. Make me. Have thine own way. Do we know who God is? Do we know what he's requiring of us? The vast amount of Americans today, the vast amount of our loved ones, they don't know. They're like Pharaoh. Why should I listen to him? Because you're going to answer to him is why. And we as the church to understand this, what does God require of us? There, there are things, be faithful. Do right. Do what I ask of you to do. If you love me, Jesus said, John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So if a person said, oh, I love the Lord, I love Jesus, but they're not keeping his commandments, there's a disconnect there. There's something not right there. How much have you been in the Word this week? 
How many people have you told about Christ, the one whom you say that you love? How many people have you told about? How, how many hours have you been in prayer before him on behalf of them, on behalf of our nation? Lord, I just want to have fellowship with you. I said if most pastors would get into the pulpits today as excited, I've tried to whip you up a little bit this morning, if these pastors that I see on social media, if they was excited and on fire for as they are for their SEC football, we'd have revival. I see the pictures of them. They got the hats. They got the outfits. They've got season tickets. They they go to every game, whether near or far. They go to them. These are preachers on Saturday. Fly in late Saturday night. Get in the pulpit Sunday morning. Tired and wore out because of the day before. Where was the preparation? Is this what Jesus would have me do? Lord, what do you require of me? God comes into your heart and he says, let's just have it out. Am I yours or not? Are you mine? Go over here a couple chapters and Moses and God goes up on the mount and, God, and Moses says to God, Lord, you said you know me by name. By name, specific name. That always stunned me and stopped me when I read that. God knows everybody's name, doesn't he? Why would Moses say that? I know you by name, God says to Moses. Specifically. Don't you feel bad about that when you come across someone, or at least I said I, I feel bad about it. I come across somebody, I see the <coughs> face, I know the face, but I can't call their name to save my life. Y'all ever done that? No, you've never done that. I'm, I'm in a ball field by myself on that one. I do that some, I said, well, they walked up to me down there at the conference out there at Wheeling, and they said, you probably don't remember me. My mind's racing a thousand miles an hour. And I said, nope, don't. Uh, sorry, I don't remember you. And they said, we was at your first broken before the throne, which was 10 years ago. I was just like stunned. I was like, wow, about that. But that was, you know, a unique moment. And say, well, I'm glad they, they remembered me, but grateful that they was there. But the opportunity when God says, I know you. I know you by name. You're mine. Because you gave your heart to me. You died to yourself. You're not living for yourself. You're living for me so that no matter what I ask of you, you'll say, Lord, I'll live for you because you died for me. My life is not my own. I gave it to you. You do with it what you want. And all that is so that at the end of the way, when we meet him face to face, he says what? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been mine for over a few things. Not a lot, a few things. What's 70 years, 80 years on this earth compared to an eternity in glory? And what is 70, 80, 90 years on this earth compared to an eternity in hell? That's not even close, is it? I can live 80 years, 90 years in this life and do what he asked of me to do so that I can spend the rest of eternity with him in heaven. I'll take that. One thing I fear and dread the most is to live 80, 90 years for myself. Killing myself for, for things, for people, for wealth, for a name, fame. Miss out. Spend an eternity down in hell. Or the, you know, the horrors of hell. Again, this stirs people up is to say, I don't want to think about that. I don't like talking about that. Hey, that's the reality. A place where the wailing and the screaming and the gnashing of teeth never stop. The fire is not quenched and it never goes out. Nothing but sorrow and misery. And the worst, my greatest comfort, my greatest joys, is when I remember, Georgie said she woke up with, Leaning on Jesus, singing an old hymn like leaning, there are no hymns sung in hell. I like when I'm going down the road and an old Christian song pops into my head. I like going back on my playlist on the YouTube and pulling out some of my old favorite songs that I haven't listened to for a while and say, boy, that brings back some good memories. I like sitting down and playing some of them and saying, boy, I'm telling you, I can remember as a junior in high school, Mom and Dad would have the, the, the set of keys there on the, on the side of the kitchen cabinet there, and I'd 
again, I'd steal the keys and I'd sneak out of the house and I'd go down to the church when nobody was paying attention. They thought I was outside playing basketball or messing around or something. No, I was down there in the church sitting there playing the, playing the piano, walking back and forth in front of that altar, praying, dying to self and giving my life to him. I had precious moments there. I had special moments there. Time with God. Floods of memory come back when I sit down and play some of them old songs that I learned there because, again, he knows me by name. And I know him because I've made time and effort to study the ways of God, the names of God, the responses of God. And all as I ever have a desire to do in this lifetime is I want to please you, Lord. Every Christian in every church is that priority right there. I just want to please you, God, because I know who you are. And any person that says, I know who God is, but I'm not pleasing him, then you know what he's going to do to you. You know what he's going to say. Why would anybody continue in that life? We beg and we plead, pulling him out of the fire over there. And at the, in James, I think it is, the, one of the last verses there, pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. No desire to spot my flesh. No desire. And all my spots that I have had, all my sins, all my failures, all my faults, all my evils that I've ever done, shame, reproach, Lord, I failed you. He says, I know you did, but I'll forgive you. Isn't forgiveness wonderful? Now, Baptist, that's when you say, cue card, glory. Because you see, I could go up in New York City up there to Times Square Church where they have the gangs and drug, drug lords and the prostitutes that have destroyed their lives and, and lived for self and lived in sin. And somebody pulled them out of the fire and told them about Jesus. And when you say, isn't God's forgiveness good? They shout. They shout the glory. Praise is, is a tears. When Raven Hill was leading chapel service up there at Times Square for, for David Wilkerson, and he said they had all the high-priced uh, prostitutes that was the, that had been brought out of that life. They was you know this back in the 80s, early 90s, whatever it was, and they were all lined up. You know, on this side was all the uh, Puerto Ricans and the Mexicans and, and, and the, all those that was in the gangs that had been brought out of all that lifestyle and delivered. And the guy come up and he and he was a little short Puerto Rican and he said, uh, he said, Mr. Ravenhill, we're glad to have you today to speak to us. He says, um, but we we often open with our with our theme song. And, and Ravenhill didn't understand. He said, you want to sing the national anthem? What? And he said, no, 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 we want to sing our theme song. And he said, oh, the Puerto Rican national anthem? What do you, he didn't get it. And they said, no, we have a song. And you know what the song was, the anthem was? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Raven Hill said, he said, I sat back in the gangs and the prostitutes sang that. He said, tears flowed, voices cracked. Worship the Lord because they knew who God was. When you're born again and saved by the blood of Christ, the mercy and grace of God, the love of God, you know. You know who He is. He's real. There is none of these words of Pharaoh. I don't know who He is. Why should I listen to Him? You know His voice and you follow Him. And when you say it, Proof's in the pudding. Your life lives it. Don't tell me that you know when you don't spend the other six days with him. Don't tell me that. That's a lie. Christians love the Lord every day because God loves us every day. He meets with us every day and we meet with him. His church likes to have a little hour from 10 to 12 on Sunday mornings. And at 12 noon, they sound the alarm bell. And they go out and they watch football. They live for themselves. They mow their yards. They, they wash their cars. They do everything else for self. And it isn't for God. The Christian 
fears and trembles before this God because they know he's righteous. He's just, he's holy. Because we know who he is and what he requires. And he calls us. Come unto me. All you that are mine, come unto me. And they rise up and they follow after. My sheep hear my voice and they do what? They follow me. We got that old hymn. I'll follow you. No turning back, no turning back. I'll follow you. And I pray today that you're not like Pharaoh. You think after the ten plagues, time might get you over there to Exodus chapter 12, chapter 13, and the ten plagues have settled on Egypt. Do you think Pharaoh knew who God was then? You go over there and read what Pharaoh says about the Lord God. The Lord is God. And he humbled himself. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess on Judgment Day, won't they? And those that are wise bow and confess now. It's a joy for us to bow and confess now. I love to tell the Lord, Lord, I love you. I just thank you so much for what you've done. I've got a whole truckload of stuff that I can dump and just say, Lord, I just want to thank you for this. Experiences. Philip was praying there, <coughs> praying there this morning. And so just as he said, may this be a, as soon as you said that, I was thinking it. Exactly in, in unison. When he said, a, may this be a divine moment. My mind, I was thinking, may this be a divine, and he said it almost simultaneously. So that I had to say, amen. I agree with that. Boy, I like that. God comes and he listens to his people and he says, I hear you. I see you. I know you by name. And we utter back to him that are saved and blood washed and blood bought and our names are in the Lamb's Book of Life and we know you. You are the Lord God. Merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving the iniquity, transgression, and sin of your people, and will by no means clear the guilty, but will visit the sins in the, uh, upon the third and the fourth generation of their children. What a name. No other name like that name. Our opportunities to know him. You must make time for that. Study, thinking, meditate. Be still. And know that I am God. That means you've got to shut the TV off. You've got to get away from people and get before God and say, Reveal yourself to me. And He will. He's so faithful in His promises. That's the reason I like to go through this so often. Lord, you said He cannot lie. So, whatever He said, you're going to do. So that when I see all these disasters happen, all these calamities. And I said to the church, the church leaders, the prayer leaders, don't you know? My famous little saying now, I'm going to have t-shirts made up of that. Don't you know? Five ninety nine. we'll have that. Don't you know? Don't you know that if my people call upon me, I will hear them and answer them? Don't you know that he said to you that are calling upon my great name, I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Don't you know that he said if you ask, he would give. If we sought, we would find. If we knocked, it would be up. Don't you know that he said if you draw nigh to me, I will draw nigh to you. Don't you know if you abide in me, I will abide in you. Don't you know that if we draw before his throne, he hears us and stands ready to answer us and show his glory. The deacon over in Hebrides revival knew who God was. And when Duncan Campbell come down out of that pulpit that night, he had preached for two hours, nine to eleven that night. And the church was packed. And he comes down and the deacon who had that Friday night prayer meeting in the barn, there's the prayer meeting, Stopped him right in the middle of the aisle. He put his hand on his shoulder and he looked up to heaven and he's not talking to Duncan Campbell, he's talking to God. Now this is when you know that this is a man or a woman of God 
when they stop having a conversation with you and say, please excuse me, i got to talk to the Lord for a moment. Puts his hand on his shoulder and he looks up and he said, God, did you not say that you would pour out water on the, on the thirsty and the dry land? And God, right there and then, it said that, that the land, the island, shook. And Duncan Campbell utters those famous Scottish words, he says, and God stepped down. Austin, this past week, they had 2,000 people crowd into a church. They've been praying for 10 years, 24 hours, 7 days a week for 10 years for Austin. 2,000 people in that, in that church the other night. Crying out to God, show us your glory. Expecting for God to show up. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is our day to know Him. To reveal what we know about Him. Study God. Know God. Listen to God. Follow after Him. And make sure. All that I say that I am, I am. I am a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will be. Till the day I die. Let's pray.